All right, it looks like we've got over 60 people uh, in, so we'll go ahead and we'll get started with what we have. I know we had uh, quite a bit of registration for this. A lot of people will probably listen afterwards, had about 250 people register. So uh, we know this topic is relevant. We appreciate you guys all tuning in and giving us a, a portion of your lunch hour here to discuss what's going on. Um, so many questions coming from so many different directions. The goal of today's webinar, we we hijacked an originally scheduled webinar that we were going to talk about um, ways that you can uh, reduce cost uh, on your lab supply, instrumentation ordering, how to negotiate uh, those vendor contracts. We're still going to cover that today, but we felt in light of what was going on, it made sense to also uh, address kind of the status of the laboratory market, specifically some of the supply chain issues that we're seeing, and it might be good to um, leverage the uh, presenters we have here today to uh, respond to that. So we wanted to um, go ahead and, and address that too as part of this. So um, we're going to give everybody a chance to respond to a few different poll questions and uh, offers throughout that will give you an opportunity to let us know what your struggles are as you're at your lab, what you're seeing in terms of um, needs, and then we're going to connect everybody with resources uh, following that. I feel like we do have a pretty good um, solution for most of what we're hearing. can't say that we can solve every problem for every lab, but we're going to try our best. Um, as always, this is a free webinar. We don't charge anything for this. I don't get paid anything from any of the presenters um, to be on this webinar, and so the goal of this is to uh, highlight sort of some tips for, for lab owners or scientists um, so they know what's available to them and uh, just connect needs with resources is, is the big push for today. So uh, just a little bit about us though, uh, Lighthouse Lab Services. My name is John Harrell. I founded Lighthouse Lab Services over 16 years ago today. We specialize in uh, recruiting and staffing. And so if you do find that you're having needs as your lab is seeing a surge in testing, we'd love to help with that. Uh, additionally, we can assist with validation. So if you guys are looking to validate COVID-19, uh, we've got about 16 different labs that have reached out that we're in the process of talking to with about seven of those moving forward. We'd love to talk to you about it. We charge 19,500, which is what we charge to uh, validate any infectious disease panel. So we haven't changed any of our pricing uh, re related to that, but we can help you get your COVID-19. Uh, panel validated so you can start testing for that and it takes about 10 days if you have the instrumentation and supplies. Um, so just saying that not as a hard sell but so you know that it's out there uh, let us know if we can help with any consulting or recruiting needs. Um, getting into the current status of the supply chain and um, feel free for any of the other presenters uh, Eric, Chris, Brent, Craig um, to weigh in with anything you're seeing Morgan and Chris as well. Um, from your customers, but what I'm seeing most commonly is a shortage of supplies. Um, we're, it seems like every time that we address one of the supply chain bottlenecks, uh, not just we as Lighthouse, but we as an industry, it pops up somewhere else. And so we're continuing to see uh, a game of whack-a-mole happen where um, all the efforts put on solving one problem and then it, it bursts somewhere else and we're only as strong as our weakest link. So nasal swabs has probably been the biggest one. Uh, where we saw a shortage of nasal swabs show up pretty quickly. Um, transport medium, viral transport medium has also been one that um, has been an issue. We're seeing a shortage of the kits. Um, there's different ways to do this test. Some groups are doing it as an IVD. They've gone through the FDA process to um, get it approved. And so, you know, groups like BioFire just announced a few hours ago, they're offering one. Cobos, you can from Roche, the Panther Fusion. Um, are all offering uh, an approved IVD um, test and they're having shortages of some of the supplies needed to get to those. So they're uh, prioritizing healthcare systems hospitals first um, is what I'm hearing mostly. Um, the work we're doing is more around LDT validation and primarily on the Thermo Fisher Quant Studio. And there is a CDC approved kit for that and um, collection method. Um, we're doing it as an LDT. We're finding that there's just a shortage of supplies related to um, the different CDC uh, kits and the instrument that they're recommending is the 7500. It's a little bit tough to get, so we're doing it on different Quant Studio platforms, the 6, 7, um, 12, the 5. 
we can we can validate on any of those and we're using uh, kind of piecing together um, collection kits as well as testing kits thermo came out with a new version two um, multiplexed uh, reagent kit for testing that's much more efficient we're seeing about 500 samples per day throughput on most of those platforms uh, if you're running an eight-hour shift um, so that's what we're seeing uh, we do have solutions for the the swabs for the viral transport medium for n95 masks um, I at least have suppliers as of today saying that they have those and so we're going to give people a chance to respond to that and um, let us know kind of what they need so i'm going to put a, a box on your screen right now if you guys are a lab that is having need for supplies go ahead and click that next step uh, and it's just going to give us a, a form for you to fill out so you can let us know what you need. And then I'm going to direct you to the appropriate uh, resource for that. So if you want to go ahead and do that, um, that'll help us to connect everybody. We're just not able to do it on a one one and one uh, situation anymore because things were, were getting a little bit wild. And by the time I would find one source and I would introduce them to 10 labs, they would run out of supplies and uh, it would have to come back to us. So um, hopefully that will be helpful. Um, I want to give an opportunity for the Acumen team, the Lab Finder team, um, to Creek Crossing. What are, what are you guys seeing um, in terms of needs from your customers as well? Anything different or anything to add? I would. Hi, it's Morgan from Lab Finder. I would add that um, from our customer side, so we work with a lot of doctors and directly with consumers. And when there's a shortage on the lab side of swabs, these doctors don't have the labs or the testing centers to send their patients. So we're seeing it kind of trickle down to our doctors big time. Yep, definitely. Um, I think that's, that's absolutely true. How about uh, Acumen or Creek Crossing? Are you guys uh, experiencing the same thing? Anything else to add? Yep. Yeah, this is Eric from Acumen. We're uh, we're seeing a lot of shortages, uh, swabs. Um, actually, we're seeing some uh, over over promising from from suppliers for COVID testing as well. Um, but of course, they are allocating. Uh, they're being very very careful in where they allocate and allocating to hotspots and things like that. Um, and we're also seeing uh, some reagent shortages. Probably just a a natural effect of um, maybe people panicking a little bit and, and stocking up. So the uh, the supply chain wasn't ready for it, but a lot of the same stuff. And um, you know, I'll I'll touch on a few specifics as well when we go through our slides. And I would just yeah. follow up basically the same um, PPE mask shortages, extraction kit shortages, swab shortages. Everything that's been said, I'm hearing it from every laboratory that uh, I'm working with. All right. Well, it sounds like I think the first step, uh, I don't remember who, who famously said it, but the first step to solving any issue is just identifying and naming the problem. And so I think the more that we can get transparency across the industry and have um, you guys respond and let us know what you're seeing, once we can really define exactly where the shortages are, it's going to be the easiest to address it. Um, like I said, we have, we have suppliers saying that they have solutions. I'm getting hit up by uh, many of those. I will go ahead and disclaim ahead of time. We're going to connect you with those suppliers. Some of them we don't have history with, right? And so uh, I do ask that you do your own due diligence and check with them before you uh, before you maybe wire money. Um, and sometimes it's going to be tough. You know, it's going to be a, a situation where we're going to have to weigh the the risk um, to reward of it all. But um, we had a supplier in China that's supplying all the kits for collection for the uh, equivalent of the Chinese uh, CDC or FDA uh, approved kit and we had some people we introduced them to that were not real comfortable with saying so I have to wire money to a Chinese company right so I'm wiring money overseas how do I know they're legitimate it's a legit question and concern some of these groups that say they have supplies I think there is um, fraud anytime that there's a natural disaster unfortunately people take advantage of it so uh, I don't have a real good answer besides trying your best to do your due diligence. We are doing that on our side as well, our best, but it's still uh, going to be up to you on whether you feel comfortable um, doing business. But we're going to go ahead making the decision that if we feel like uh, a group saying that they have a solution, we're going to introduce them to people that have that need and then leave it up to the two parties to, to figure out the rest. So, um, all right. 
Well, I want to next introduce um, Morgan and Chris from LabFinder. Uh, Morgan is the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships. She focuses on the company-wide initiatives, growth strategy, product development, and partnership opportunities. And uh, Chris is co-founder and CEO, and uh, his role at LabFinder is overseeing the technology and product and working with customers on their integration. So I'll go ahead and I'll hand it over to Morgan. Morgan, you can tell us a little bit about LabFinder and how you fit into the solution. Yes. Hi. Thank you for the introduction. So LabFinder.com, we launched March 1st, 2016. We're headquartered in New York City, and we've been hyper-focused on laboratory and imaging. So when a patient or a provider needs to get access to a test, we help them search based on the type of test ordered, location, so where they work, where they live, in the most convenient day and time. We also help these um, patients and providers find in-network laboratory solutions, as well as fair market pricing. So if someone's looking to pay self-pay, we're able to connect them with that right lab. So with everything that's going on right now with coronavirus testing, we've been helping New York City consumers and doctors get access to testing with some of our lab partners. Um, so being um, on this webinar, we really want to connect and grow this directory so that we can contain this virus and provide all of our providers with more resources when it comes to different laboratories that they can send patients to to get access to testing. Um, so that's really what we're looking for here today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. We are looking to add test centers at no cost during this um, crisis. So we'd love to work with anyone who's interested. Right. So, Morgan, if somebody is validated for COVID uh, or they're coming online, they could go to LabFinder and register their lab there to be a, a lab that would receive samples for people in need. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Um, so especially if they have uh, – if they're working closely with, say, a hospital, urgent care, doctor's offices – we're very interested in really connecting consumers to, to any of these provider offices that you're working with to get these specimens to your laboratory. So if we can get you listed, it will provide more transparency, access, because that's the biggest issue. I would say majority of the calls we get daily right now, and it's a lot, is where, where can I get tested? What lab is running these tests? Um, what labs are validated, just like you just said, John, for COVID testing. Um, and one thing we have been seeing a lot of is labs are taking appointments or saying that they can do these tests, but then they run out of whether the doctor's office runs out of swabs or they run out of the reagent to um, complete the specimen test. What about if a laboratory wants to refer out to another lab? What's the best way? Is there a solution um, for lab-to-lab -lab referral on the site, or what's the best way to um, for one lab to maybe find another lab they can refer to? Yeah, so we actually work with a ton of labs. So when you just look at um, the typical blood work, the you know, most traditional panels. There are, and then also some of the specialty testing. In New York, we work with a lot of laboratories that will accept a specimen, but they may refer it to a larger laboratory to actually reference it. But the result still comes back from that first laboratory. So whatever agreement that they set up um, when it comes to that is um, between those two labs, but we just ask for the results back to the patient is, um, we make sure each patient has access to their results on LabFinder. Excellent. Okay. Well, that sounds great. I just threw a poll up there to take a look at it, guys. Let us know, are you validated for your lab? Are you in process of doing it? Um, or are you referencing it out? Um, it's good for us just to have a feel for the industry of, you know, what percentage of labs are either doing this, thinking about it, or referencing it. And I'm sure that um, that's all being done very manually. Normally, when we put together lab to lab reference deals, it's Bob calls Frank, Frank yeah. calls me, and I call Mike, and then we put something together. And so I love the idea of what LabFinder brings here 
to be able to kind of automate that and give some visibility um, to who's doing the testing and where things can be referenced to. So yeah. uh, I appreciate that. I want to that. add one thing if possible. So even if a lab isn't validated for COVID testing, um, we are working very closely with our um, with the RPP swabs. Um, I know a lot of those are now being reflexed to COVID, but if your laboratory is doing RPP, that's also a really great way that we can rule out that they don't have one of those um, viruses before they get COVID tested. So. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for uh, telling us a little bit more about LabFinder. If anybody wanted to hear more, click that box on your screen and we'll make sure we get everybody connected. Um, next, I'd like to introduce the team from Acumen. Um, Acumen, you're probably familiar with or have heard of, has just grown uh, at a tremendous speed over the last, I think it's nine years that you guys have been in business, but correct me if I'm wrong, and I think over 300 employees now, and they are experts at uh, the lab supply chain, looking at um, you know consumable costs, instrumentation costs, and just helping labs to save money. Um, and so I thought it would be a really good uh, group to bring on during this time so they can tell a little bit about what they do and um, also tell a little bit about uh, some tips that they might have for uh, negotiating supply chains. And so I'm going to introduce Eric first. And I think uh, Eric is probably the, the, the mo has supply chain more in his blood than anybody I know. Uh, Eric, I believe if I remember correctly, you told me at one point that like your grandfather is a supply chain guy, your father was a supply chain guy, and you're now in the supply chain uh, world. And so uh, if you don't mind, go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about Acumen and uh, about yourself and how you guys are helping uh, in this situation, how you can help labs. Sure. Thanks, John. And yes, I, uh, I like to joke and say I came out of the womb in the supply chain. Um, my whole family has worked in the various capacity of supply chain. Uh, but again, thank you for the opportunity, John. Yeah, uh, as John mentioned, we're from Acumen. We're a laboratory for performance partner. And uh, we were asked to present on some tips in, uh, in how to better negotiate your, your lab contract. So I'm going um, I'm going to start the presentation, though, just to kind of address, uh, you know, the elephant in the room, what's going on, COVID-19 testing, and, and just some, some tips in, that everybody can be, you know, mindful of and considered. Uh, while they're going through this. I mean, we're all in this together. So um, it's, you know, it's no one person's fault. And then I'll hand it off to uh, Brent, who's going to talk about a little bit of uh, history. And then uh, Chris, who will go into the, uh, the uh, round it off, and bring it all together as uh, who, who is Acumen. So um, like I said, I'm going to kick it off here. Uh, of course, these are unprecedented times. So right now, we don't, we don't know what we don't know yet, and we only know what we know right now. So it's, you know, this is all very new, very fluid, and very uh, changing very fast. So we put together a few tips here. Um, there's going to be one slide here on the short term, one slide on the long term. And again, there's no silver bullet here to solving this problem, but being prepared, I think, is uh, is probably probably the best uh, best thing for everyone. Um, so number one, we think. Thinking outside of the box is probably one of the number one things to deal with a lot of these shortages right now. A couple, uh, couple examples of that. Vertically integrate, some people are starting to make versus buy. Um, you know, swabs, a lot of people are making their own swab kits now, getting creative. A lot of people are making their own PPE now. Uh, we're forced into this unprecedented situation and it's, it's actually driving a little bit of innovation and um, you know, some, of the, some of the things we're seeing are quite creative. Um, just heard this morning, uh, um, isolation gowns, a uh, uh, McLaren hospital up in Michigan partnered with a local plastic manufacturing company to, to, uh, to work on a disposable uh, gown, which comes in, in basically a roll, and they did it rather fast. So a lot of great things. Um, so we're telling everybody, think outside of the box. Next thing, um, evaluate appropriate platforms. You know, think out of the box when doing that, but be mindful, don't overcommit. Um, you know, one good, uh, good option is obviously Lighthouse. John's, John's company does this. So um, just make sure, you, you know, it's, it's appropriate for you because you do have a business to run. And I'm pretty certain 99% of the folks here are not in business just solely for COVID. So be mindful of your business. And, and uh, I think, John, you mentioned it. Don't go too far. That, uh, don't play whack-a-mole and go too far down that channel. Um, so be mindful of that. Leverage your network. Uh, share best practices, and you'll be surprised. Um, when I came to healthcare, I was I was extremely 
uh, surprised at how um, how uh, good healthcare is at sharing supplies, hospitals, laboratories, calling each other in, in times of need. Uh, so make sure you're uh, you're doing that uh, and keep your options open. Obviously, you want to find what what fits best for your needs. You know, make sure you're always considering. Um, you know, if you're a small lab, is a Coba 6800 you know a right COVID test for you in the long term? Maybe not. Um, that that capital could probably be used elsewhere. So again, just uh, just be mindful of, uh, of of your needs. And um, lastly, ask for help. It's it's okay to ask for help. Um, this is this is stretched to everybody. There's a lot of third parties that can use the workload for you while you are focusing on your immediate needs. Um, you know whether that be a company like Lighthouse, Acumen, Lab Finder, et cetera. There's there's many of them. So it's okay to ask for help. So as short-term next steps, what do we do? Well, uh, we think it's most important to form a task force or a committee within your organization. This will eliminate impulsive reactions, redundant work. Um, also engage your local authorities, emergency managers, keep, keep, keep in close contact with, uh, with local, you know, local regulations, what your state's doing, things like that. And uh, the last one there is communicate. And I put it there once, but I'm gonna say it three times. Communicate, communicate, communicate. That is so important in, in this time, especially when you might have a lot of employees working from home, it can get pretty lonely, so. Um, all right, what's next? So obviously we, we address the short-term goals. In the long-term, um, you know, if, if there's one key takeaway from this slide, it's, it's learn, learn from what's happening right now and be agile. Reassess your supply chain. Implement a supply management program. Um, and what I mean by that is, is uh, you know, after these shortages and we get through this, um, re reassess uh, your supply chain management. Maybe that's mapping mapping your upstream supply base, finding out where uh, where 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 is the origin of of things. You know, one of the issues is right now we had this maybe a lot of panic buying. We had obviously a um, a surge of of swab usage for for the obvious reasons, and the supply chain just wasn't prepared. So. You know, maybe limiting yourself to one supplier uh, is not a smart um, a smart path going forward. So, you know, dual sourcing, consider that uh, this not only keeps suppliers competitive, but it also adds redundancy. Um, so, you know, reassessing your supply chain and identifying those critical items. And I know a lot of people are going to say, well, it's the laboratory, it's healthcare, everything is critical. Um, and unfortunately, it, it is. Unfortunately, it is. Um, but if everything's critical, nothing's critical. So you really have to be intentional about I, sitting down and identifying um, what is critical and how do you uh, how do you diversify so you're not you're not um, solely reliant on say one supplier for something. So part of long-term next steps and uh, timelines: evaluate your sourcing strategies and learn. Identify your high-risk areas and build a contingency plan. In some cases, you may have to adjust safety stock. Um, but again, I think the main main takeaway here is uh, learn from this. Um, you know, I was thinking earlier, a lot of these shortages we saw in 2009 with H1N1, we saw them with Ebola. Um, you know, and this this crisis, it, it came around full circle again. And some of these, uh, like PPE, for example, seeing the exact same shortages. So. Um, encourage everyone to, you know, look deep, ask for help, and uh, let's let's learn from this together. And uh, with that being said, I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce Brent. He's gonna take us through uh, negotiating lab contracts and uh, some tips there. Brent has been with Acumen for uh, about 16 years, but he too uh, is a, a lifelong supply chain with over 18 years of experience, uh, focused in the clinical lab. Brent has a Proven track record of supply chain cost reductions, continuous improvement, uh, and uh, management. So, with that being said, Brent, uh, take it away. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, um, you know, Eric did a, a great job there explaining some of the issues that are that are happening now with the COVID-19 supply chain. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot a little bit and just kind of talk about the lab supply chain and why just the laboratory supply chain is so complicated. Um, so. Uh, when you when you think about acumen and how we engage with our partners, um, we typically partner with 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 health systems that are 
very large. I mean, you know, 150 hospital health systems all the way down to small rural hospitals. And we also partner with uh, independent labs. Uh, labs who are who are essentially a third party reference lab to those hospitals. So we we cover the continuum of working with different laboratories throughout the country. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a big system or a small system, all labs are facing the same headwinds. So I'm going to talk about some of those headwinds over the next couple of slides. But um, I wanted to start off by just showing uh, a graph that I think is very telling. Um, this is essentially the changes in healthcare costs versus the reimbursements and how staggering uh, the costs are going up in healthcare um, versus other areas, um, uh, you know, other commodities that are out there. My dad was bragging the other day that he bought this enormous TV for like $300, and he was joking that he replaced one that he had bought just 10 years ago, and it was a $7,000 TV at the time. So he went from a $7,000 TV to a $3,000, or sorry, $300 TV. So if you think about not all costs are going up, but healthcare is, and they're going up by over the last decade, 240%. So we want to we want to talk about some of those challenges over the next couple of slides, and then talk about how we can combat that uh, going forward for specifically for labs. So when we think about some of the challenges that are out there with the lab supply chain, um, first of all, I want to I want to dive in and just say lab is complicated. Uh, lab is without question very unique. Uh, it's super technical. It's it. You know, whether you're an independent lab or you're a hospital lab, every department is very different. Um, and the lab is responsible for over 80% of uh, patient care, patient diagnosis. The lab is the center for that patient care. And so you can, you, when you think about a hospital or, or an independent lab, you got to make sure that your lab leadership completely understands all the various complexities uh, that are in that laboratory. And, and one person typically can't do it all. Right, most people don't understand microbiology, cytology, chemistry, tissue, you know, all the various categories that are out there within the lab. Uh, it is very, very complicated. And then when you tack on having someone in supply chain or leadership who's trying to source these products, if it's not the same person, man, it's a, it's a challenging area within, within um, uh, the laboratory. So you, it's a really tough, and you've got to make sure that your, your lab, your supply chain, and your leadership are all aligned because the lab is very complicated. The next challenge I want to bring up is that the, ra the, the lab is rapid uh, technological changes. It's constantly changing. And this isn't going to surprise anyone listening to the webinar today, but a, a big reason why the lab is complicated is that it's constantly evolving, right? And because all of these modalities are very different, you know, chemists, microbiologists, blood bankers, they're all very different. Um, and when you throw in the rapid change, it's hard, it's hard for any one person to be an expert in everything. So, you know, just think about like, uh, you know, flu testing, okay? F flu testing from, you know, all the available methods that we have today. Um, you've got all these different options. You've got rapid flu tests, you've got molecular PCR tests, you've got multiplex panels, uh, and other, you know, so, so which one do we use, right? Uh, and there are so many things that are constantly changing. It just makes it very complicated um, to determine, you know, which vendors and which products are the best at any given time because everything's changing so fast. Another thing that is a headwind in lab supply chain is vendor consolidation. And this might not seem like a big deal, but um, it is definitely a big deal, especially for, for some smaller labs and, and um and some of the smaller hospitals that we partner with. I remember I had a, a college uh, econ professor back in the 90s who'd chant a little ma uh, mantra before each class, and he would say, okay, remember, if you guys learn nothing else in this course, always remember that taxes are bad and competition is good. <laughs> so, so looking back, I obviously know where he stood politically, but his point about competition is absolutely fair, right? Competition keeps prices down, Competition spurs creativity and innovation. Competition ensures product supply and high quality service. And the lack of competition allows vendors to raise pricing, not invest as much in R&D, and to not focus as diligently on high quality customer services. So, so it's true that competition is a good thing. Um, unfortunately, the trend we're seeing in the lab industry right now is that a few of the major manufacturers are buying up a lot of the competition. These vendors are trying to expand into every category in the lab so that a health system or a, an independent lab can go to a one-stop shop. And it's, 
that's not all bad and it does have some advantages, but vendor consolidations right now are becoming a challenge. And then the last challenge I want to address is, is that depending on your, you know, facility, whether you're a small hospital or an independent lab, you know, there's, there's many times a lack of collaboration between the lab and business leadership. Okay, who are those key stakeholders? How are they communicating? And some organizations, there's a clear process for proactively identifying opportunities for cost reduction and quality improvement, but the lab and the supply chain leadership are not always on the same page. Um, you know, the, the lab or a senior specialist or, or a pathologist might be the one who's picking the products that they want to use. Um, they may or may not get a quote from those vendors. And by the time your supply chain team or your, your lab leadership is involved, the vendor already knows they're gonna win the business. So you don't have a whole lot of negotiating leverage going forward. <clears throat> so the, the challenge is getting all of those individuals on the same page uh, up front so that you can get a really aggressive pricing and get the quality uh, products that you want um, going forward. So let's talk real quick about some strategies uh, for the lab. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and, and how we combat those headwinds. So the first strategy is to create a long-term strategic sourcing roadmap. Okay, and again, it might seem obvious, but this simple suggestion is a key factor in making sure that we've got a strategy and, and everyone's addressing it. Without a plan that looks to the future, you'll, you'll probably always be reacting to supply chain agreements that are expiring in just a couple months. The key to strategic sourcing is having that long-term plan, and, and that plan's got to include things like chemistry, hematology, micro, blood bank, all of that. And when you put that plan together, uh, you can use that as your roadmap going forward. Um, <clears throat> and again, that might seem pretty obvious, but it's, it's key to have a strategic plan going forward. Um, next, I want to talk about test repatriation. Um, many of you, uh, your labs are already doing that. You're, you're bringing in all the testing that you can. Um, and, you know, it's really a unique opportunity within the laboratories to say, what analyzers do I have? What equipment do I have? What can I bring in to better serve uh, my patients or my clients? And if you're constantly doing that make versus buy analysis. So think about test repatriation opportunities because it can help you to bring down your costs uh, while also increasing your revenue. And then last but not least, the last strategy I want to talk about is being proactive about capital planning. <clears throat> and again, that sounds obvious, I get that, but a lot of health systems and a lot of small labs don't do it. You know, we, most people aren't looking out three to five years, but you need to make sure that you are. Um, and as part of that, you know, you can calculate your return on investment and, and what kind of annual operating cost savings you're going to see uh, going forward. That can help you to determine whether you want to do a capital purchase or a reagent rental. So the key to justifying um, cost savings and ROIs to plan ahead. And then last but not least, um, the, the, the last strategy for helping to reduce costs and kind of combat some of those headwinds is to talk about uh, consolidating vendors and, and products as a strategy to create economies of scale. And I know that I said that when you, you know, consolidate your you're essentially getting rid of that competition, but when you do it proactively and on your own and as your own choice, then you're creating win-win solutions with that vendor, uh, and you're you're going to be able to reduce your costs, um, and you're proactively picking that vendor to get more business, so you're going to be able to drive down those costs. Okay, and then uh, the the last slide I've got here is just a couple other cost-saving tactics on vendor agreements. Um, really just make sure that when you've got that quote <clears throat> that you are doing the math okay do the math to determine how it's going to impact your labor your supplies and your capital to figure out the total cost of ownership for every section and every category over the life of that contract compare your different options whether they are reagent rentals or capital um, you there are a lot of hidden fees and reagent rentals and so you just have to be very careful when you're doing that to make sure that you unburden that pricing to determine what's the best offer, whether it's capital or reagent rental. You'll be very surprised if you can come up with the capital, how often a cap capital proposal is going to be a lot better than a reagent rental, especially if your volumes are going up. So when we talk about volumes, make sure that those volume commitments are, are spot on. You don't want to overcommit to volume because then you're going to be um, not meeting your commitments with that vendor, but you don't want to undercommit either. 
Um, so if you undercommit, you're going to be, especially with a reagent rental, you might pay for that capital multiple times over. Um, and you also won't be getting volume discounts. So make sure that volume is right where it should be. Give yourself a, you know, a few percent buffer up and down, uh, but make sure that volume commitment is spot on. And then um, last but not least, you know, look at, look at the pricing escalators. They can get out of hand quickly. Make sure that they're just a couple percent. Honestly, you should fight for fixed costs you know, fixed pricing throughout the life of the agreement. But if you're going to agree to a pricing escalator, make sure that it's a small one or make sure that it's tied to CPI. Don't let it get out of hand. You know, I've seen five to 7% escalators and that's just, that's completely out of line with the market. Um, one other tip would be to um, match the agreement term to the equipment useful life. You know, there are plenty of pieces of equipment out there uh, that might last, you know, seven to 10 years right? A, a blood culture analyzer might last seven years. So it doesn't do you any good to make a three-year commitment or a four-year commitment. If you're going to have this piece of equipment for seven years, make a seven-year deal. The vendors will give you a better deal on it. So match the agreement term to the equipment useful life. Um, and then um, again, another one that might seem obvious is just go to bid and know your options, right? Don't just only talk to one vendor. Make sure you talk to lots. Make sure you get to quotes from a lot of them so that you have a, you can make an eyes wide open decision on what the total cost of ownership is going to be for all those different various options. All right. And then last but not least, I'll, I'll pass it over to Chris to talk about hiring the experts here. Um, and it, it might sound a little bit self-serving, but um, really, you know, each of us have a lane that we play in and, and we can always use some help. So, um, you know, it, if it's right for you, reach out and, and get some of that support uh, going forward. Great. Thanks, Brent. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Daffner. I'm the Director of Growth and Strategy at Acme. I just want to take one minute to tell you a little bit more about us as a company and how we believe we can we can help folks on this line to help them optimize their, their supply chain costs in their lab. So Acme was formed nine years ago, as John mentioned. We're, we're um, a performance partner, and, and we use those words intentionally in that we are not a traditional consultant and that we go 100% at risk. We put our money where our mouth is where we do not charge upfront fees for our work. Um, we partner with laboratories, bringing our people, our process, and our technology to partner with them and help them actually execute on these cost savings. And if we do not execute on those savings and, and you don't see them hit your bottom line, we do not get paid. So our model is no upfront fees. We're 100% at risk. We only we share in a percentage of the, of the savings that we help drive for you. So no savings and nothing out of pocket for you. Um, and so the reason we're so successful and we're working with over 450 laboratories today is because of this model, right? We bring our people, our processes, and our technology. From a people perspective, we have a dozen laboratory supply chain experts. So, right, uh, it's 4% of the health system spend in the lab, right? It's 100% of our focus. It's all that we do. And we hired experts from the industry, from the Siemens of the world, from um, the lab cores of the world, et cetera, who really know these categories inside and out. And it's all that we do. From a process perspective, because we're working with over 450 labs across the country, we've seen everything, right? We were working with all the GPOs, uh, for-profit hospitals, not-for-profit, independent labs, commercial reference laboratories, really runs the gamut. And, and because of that, those cycles and, and how ingrained we are in the lab and in those contracts, that's where we're able to really drive the value. So a great example is typical lab does a chemistry agreement every five to seven years, right? We're doing a dozen chemistry agreements every year with our, our laboratory partners, right? So we know all the all what's going on and, and the latest information to drive the best value and the best outcomes for you as the laboratory. Um, you know, a lot of what Brent mentioned before, right? The tips and tricks and, and not getting stuck with more than you need. And then the technology, right? So again, we have, we have dynamic market intelligence that provides us a comprehensive value analysis that we can quickly do um, for your laboratory. So right, the, all, the, all that data and information that we've gathered from working with all these folks um, really helps us bend the cost curve. And the results are, are there. We're driving 15 to 20% cost savings for our laboratory clients. Uh, again, I mentioned over 450 today. Um, we're managing $600 million in lab spend that we're helping save money on. And we've saved $90 million in hard lab supply chain cost um, company to date. Uh, that number will pass uh, into 100 million this year in 2020. So, um, you know, please, I'd if, if, um, love to have an initial discussion with you to see if we can help. Uh, no risk. And, and so I've left my contact information at the bottom of this page. Um, so please reach out if, if um, you're interested. And in, in, I know in these challenging times that everyone, everyone's looking to cut costs, uh, we can be that business partner in the background helping you do that while you focus on this crisis um, and what's at the, the forefront of your mind. So thank you, everyone. 
Thanks, Chris. Thanks, uh, thanks everybody there on the Acumen team. Yeah, I love that. I love that you guys do it risk-free. Um, I encourage you guys to reach out to Acumen, um, whether it's just uh, in realizing that your your thoughtfulness behind how you acquire supplies in your supply chain is has been lacking and you need to give some intentionality to that, or if you just want to get an audit review of what they do. I know I've had my customers do that and be happy with it. So uh, they'll look at what you're spending and if they can't save you money, um, you, there's no risk to you. So I felt like it'd be good to get them in front of everybody as that might be uh, a way to help during these uh, trying times. Uh, next, I'm going to introduce Greg from uh, Creek Crossing Management. As we were thinking about who do we need to get in front of our lab owners when we're we're dealing with this situation and people can't get supplies, um, I was thinking of Greg. Greg specializes, got 20 years of experience, specializes in the shipping of perishable um, perishable items. Been doing lab shipping with a former lab owner, understands the complications of that and just has some really interesting proprietary discounts with some of the major shippers um, that you're able to leverage by working with him. So I don't know how much intentionality you guys have put behind uh, your shipping costs or how much you look at that. I think this is a growing area with labs starting to offer direct-to-consumer testing, and uh, there's more and more shipping that's happening as part of that. And just knowing how to navigate uh, shipment hurdles like getting caught in customs and some of those items, it's good to have an expert who's been doing this for a long time. Uh, on your side of the, the table. So I'd like to introduce Greg Lewis from Creek Crossing. Greg, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do and how you help with uh, with the issues? Okay, good deal. Uh, thanks, John. And, and as in the shipping business, everything needs to be done now. I'm going to try to take the next three minutes to give time for Q&A. Uh, we're used to doing things quick and, and, and somewhat on demand. So some of this has already been said. I, I've had a uh, extensive uh, healthcare experience. Uh, we've been a former recovering lab owner, um, and we I divested all of our of our lab ownership, and I strictly handle logistics full time for laboratories and some other uh, specialty indices uh, that need perishable shipments. We do about thirty five thousand to forty five thousand shipments a month. Again, uh, with the COVID season, which is what I'm calling this right now, is this is unprecedented. I mean, we're sending. 10,000 labels out uh, on top of all the other stuff we're doing on a daily basis. It is somewhat insane, but we have, uh, we've, we've navigated the process. We know who to call to get supplies, uh, to get the UN 4373s and so forth. And I'll talk about that here, here in a minute. Um, our growth and knowledge uh, throughout the, the process has helped us gain uh, our, our negotiated carriers agreements. We continually uh, are working on agreements. Uh, we've learned the carrier environment just by listening and, and talking and learning on every shipment. I mean, you can learn something every every time there's a mistake. It's, a, it's an opportunity uh, to gain some knowledge and not allow that to ha happen again or to find out how to fix it. Uh, and we do this all through a, a proprietary a unified software program that we have uh, put together, which allows uh, UPS, uh, FedEx, DHL, LSO here in, in Texas, Lone Star, uh, to all be on one system. That's our unified process that I, I list here. You can do all the shipping, all the tracking, schedule pickups. Uh, we do return management, so all the return labels that you guys all send out there and you sit there and wait, and half of them don't get used, but yet you somebody requests another 100 or 1,000 more. Uh, we have ways of tracking all those now to where they, when they get used, they go into an in-process uh, category with our system. Challenging to do those things with uh, with the, the carrier systems, um, and so what we did is made a system that uh, that is easier and more friendly and more efficient. Uh, uh, the biggest part of the of the having our own system that we utilize is the data. Data is in every industry is, is what you want, and especially in this one, we run trends, we analyze, we see issues, we have alerts. It's a big process of shipping, um, and we also use that in all of our ongoing. Uh, carrier uh, communications and, and negotiations. Um, we handle supplies, procurement, and, fulfill and fulfillment. Right now, that's a big thing because getting clinical packs, we're getting them in pallet loads, direct ship to different labs that need them instead of calling up your local uh, executive and getting 50 here or whatever is based on your usage. Well, your current usage isn't today's usage. We all know that, and therefore, it is definitely definitely challenging and Again, by networking and understanding the environment, uh, I have direct contacts with people I cannot give their number out, but when I need a pallet, 
And as long as it's available from FedEx's vendors, I got a pallet on uh, in process. I have two pallets of 21,000 per pallet packs coming to me right now just so we can handle the fulfillment that's needed. And what we do is we print labels, we pop them on uh, the packs, and we'll send them out to customers directly uh, as our customers order them. So we'll send them to their customers. Uh, I stock label printers, the, the Zebra ZP450s. I have a, a source where I get those. I keep 20 of them on site at all times. It's a must in this in this environment. We have the ability to email labels out, which is all these kind of problem points that I think you'll find at your at your locations. We can email them out, and we're and we're fixing to launch a chat and text pickup where you just chat us or text us, and we'll get that pickup scheduled and send you back the uh, the pickup number. Again, pain point within the shipping process. Uh, return labels and recurring pickup management. Uh, it's a part of the, the, the software where we, we make sure all, all labels go out as return labels Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday. That's a big deal, especially in the COVID environment. Um, and we, we have a process and a, and a platform to, to handle the pickup management, meaning we will schedule a recurring pickup by authorizing an account number, following back up, making sure it's in there with, uh, with dispatch, and making sure dispatch has not only confirmed it, but the driver knows about it. Those are all things that have to happen to really get those pickups working like they're supposed to. And then from a Salesforce perspective, we can help allocate accounts to Salesforce so they can help manage that process. Their account can call them. They can schedule a pickup. Uh, it's, it's, again, just the challenge points that we see throughout uh, the shipping process. Again, I'm going to skip through some of this for the sake of time. We've networked our way. I would tell you that if if you continue doing shipping on your own or with somebody, if you talk to somebody and you get a phone number or an email, grab it, hang on to it. It's gold in this process. Um, FedEx is way easier to work with on average at all dispatch locations uh, because it's a non-union environment. Nothing against unions. It's just easier to work with, uh, in my opinion, uh, versus UPS, which is a union environment. You need to know that because if uh, a package gets stuck in a can uh, right on the tarmac in Louisville with, U with UPS, prob probably not going to get that out. But with FedEx, I have physically had people walk out there, open the can, and get it for us. Um, and then ground is contract. It is what it is. Ground is tough, and but it's, it's cheap, uh, very inefficient in my opinion, and you get what you pay for. Um, a couple of just points I wanted to make. Uh, there's a lot of talk right now. Can we get can we get packages early? Can we just do early AM and pay for it? You can, it's expensive. The better way is to go to the station. We'll call the general manager of the station and ask if we can do early AM pickups ourselves. We're able to get these, these, uh, these kits uh, in to the lab before 24 hours at no additional cost, and they love it. They love the fact that you'll come pick it up and they don't have to deliver it, driving down their cost because their volume is way up in this environment. Again, watch the trend analyze, analyze the data. That's what we do. Uh, and we just, that's our constant goal is to understand what's going on. Uh, how you get, again, I talk about service first because that's the biggest part of it. Yes, discounts and accessory fees, the cost of doing this business is, is a big deal. How you get those, uh, those discounts is volume. Um, we do aggregated volume. Uh, we have basic, we have aggregated volume over all the folks that we're working with versus just one lab. And so, that's where you get your your ability to get uh, to get uh, discounts. Again, we we watch our trends. You have to understand what you're who you're shipping to: residential, commercial, ground, express. Um, right now, the residential lines are full because there's a lot of uh, direct to residents pickups and or deliveries uh, because of the environment. Um, you got to watch the financials of the carriers when you're negotiating. You got to see what's going on right now. Back, I'm not going to go into it because I know we're running shorter on time. But when UPS uh, and Amazon have their business because FedEx dropped out, there was opportunity. Now with coronavirus, there's no opportunity to get residential discounts. There's just not because their their residential line is blowing up. We already we're there. We proactively made some of those things happen, which is benefiting all of our customers at this point. Um, and again, strictly for us, we we've got everything that we do is based on aggregated volume. Um, our, our discounts and our accessory fees are because we do uh, a high amount of volume in mainly a perishable uh, and expedited mar market. We send big boxes to residential and we, we send one pound FedEx packs to commercial labs 
Uh, and again, we have established rates for all of these things prior to um, all the craziness that is the, the COVID environment now. Uh, I'm going to, we, we, I'll, I'll put it in DHL. I'm doing a lot of international shipping. I have thoroughly had a crash course of how to ship from Hong Kong and China. If you need any help with that, I'm happy to help. We've got some great rates uh, in making that happen. And we have been shipping lots of stuff across here. It's, and it's, again, a crazy environment. I won't dive in there, but FedEx, UPS, DHL, we work with all the, the majors. A couple of case studies, and John, one more minute and I'll be done. A couple of case studies is, uh, this is an account that is spending about, about 20,000 a week. We went through an analysis of, of their uh, spend. We were able to bring it down uh, by $3,500 and save them about 18% on a weekly basis. And this is strictly, I had an invoice, we looked at everything and how we could help them um, from a service and cost perspective, and we were able to save them 18%. On this one, same same matrix, different spin levels, but we were able to send them 36%. And uh, again, happy to go through any uh, analysis for you guys. And it's the starting point of, of working with Creek Crossing is that we do a quick analysis of what's going on, what you're looking at. We highlight the transportation and, re and rate fee reductions. We, we highlight the automation and how the software could help you. Um, we and, and it's free. The the integration is, uh, of our software system. We don't charge for that. Uh, and we want you to use it for the data. And then uh, we we start the process. If we engage, it makes sense. We start the process and and, and start to manage the expectations. That was quick, John. I'm going to pass it back to you for anything else. And uh, I look forward to talking to any of you uh, you folks out there and, and see if we can help you out. I appreciate that, Greg. Thank you very much. Um, I will go ahead and I'll open it up to questions at this time. I realize uh, one of the things I did not push earlier, I'm going to throw out there now. If you are looking for a reference to a COVID-19 testing lab, let us know that specifically. I know we're, we're going to give you some options through Lab Finder, but uh, we can start making some connections with labs that are already up and running if you need that. Um, but I'll go ahead and I'll open it up to some Q&A. And uh, if you have any questions for, for us, for the presenters, um, let us know. And we'll we'll field those. You can use the chat function or the Q and A function um, to address a question, and we'll we'll do our best to answer that. Um, I have seen that some questions were: Will this presentation be available after the webinar? And yes, there's a recording that will get sent to everyone that registered. So uh, if there's anything you wanted to go back to and listen to again, you'll have the opportunity to do that. We also do post these on YouTube, and they'll be available live on that. Um, but if you have any questions, let us know. I will also, while you guys are thinking about that, give uh, opportunity if you want to hear any more from, from me, from Lighthouse, if we can help with anything, if you need more molecular scientists, specimen processors, we can do those attempts as firm. If you want help validating COVID-19 in your lab, let us know that. We'd love to, love to help in any way that we can. You need a lab director, let us know. Um, but it looks like um, I, don't see, I don't see any questions, so hopefully our presenters did a really good job. It looked like we had up around 115 people live on this um, today, which is a great showing. Um, I encourage you to reach out to these, uh, to these experts in their field so they can help you out. They're here to help. We thank you guys, as always, for, uh, for attending, and um, appreciate, uh, appreciate your time and wish you the best. Stay safe.